Okay, so we'll go. <coughs> Acts chapter 8. Which says. And Saul, this was right after the uh, martyrdom of Stephen at the end of chapter 7. And Saul, that Saul, was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad and throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great, great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women and committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were, uh, that were possessed with them. And many were uh, taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. For there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the fame city uh, used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they went, sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. This is a great proof text against indulgences, by the way. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of the things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, whom had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this, excuse me, to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him and read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readst? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare this generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other, or another? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. 
And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at, and I can't read that. Philip was found at Azotus. Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Okay, so that's what we're going to study tonight. All right. So we see, just kind of as a footnote at the beginning of this chapter, we see Saul, who was standing there with the coats when Stephen was stoned, and he was going around persecuting the church mightily, which we know, and then we'll see more of that, and then in the next chapter we will see Paul's conversion take place. Uh, but for right now we just see that he is going all over persecuting the church. And the, uh, the people are scattered, so the believers are scattered. They're kind of underground right now. Uh, because of one, because of this persecution of the church is taking place. And uh, again, Christianity is not legal. Um, it's not illegal because the Romans don't know what to make of it yet. They just understand it as being another sect of Judaism. They didn't really know what to make of it. So it's not technically illegal, but the other Jews are going after them because they don't want people preaching the name of Christ. So we just kind of get an introduction to Saul real quick there. And then we go into Philip's story. And, let's see. So Philip went down to the city of Samaria. There's a lot of cities in Samaria. They don't know which one. Uh, maybe Luke's readers knew which one was like the city at the time. Uh, but we don't know which one it was. They proposed many. Uh, we just don't know which city it was. But he's preaching the gospel, and they're all paying attention to him. They're all hearing him, and he's performing wonders also. So again, one of those things that in the apostolic age they were able to do is they were able to perform the same miracles Jesus did. It was kind of like their credentials. Well, how can you preach us these things? Well, number one, we were witnesses to them. This is what Jesus did, and look, we can do that too. No, they didn't say it that way. They just, by their words and actions, uh, did it. So they were proclaiming the gospel. Philip's proclaiming the gospel. He's healing people, and he's casting out demons. Exactly what Jesus did, right? Healed the sick, cast out demons, raised the dead, proclaimed the gospel. But now we got this guy, Simon. Okay, so it says who previously practice magic. Let's talk about the Samaritans first. So Samaria. Okay, do you guys remember uh, in the Old Testament the two kingdoms basically of the people of God when they were divided? So you have Israel and Judea, right? So you have the northern tribes and the southern tribes. So the southern tribes whose city was Jerusalem, right? Uh, and they eventually... The kings of Israel, you remember reading like First, Second Kings, Chronicles. Were any of the kings of Israel actually any good? <laughs> really? No, they weren't. They were all faithless eventually. Uh, so the kingdom of Israel per se ceased to exist. Those northern tribes went away. Uh, I'm just looking at some notes here. Right, so all the southern tribes, Judah, Benjamin, those guys, uh, became known as the land of Judah, uh, where also the people of God, and Jerusalem was their holy city. And there was a division, so you had Israel and Judah, right? Jesus was, that's where we get the word Jew, the Judeans, that's where, that's the remnant of the tribes that were left. So Jesus is of the tribe of Judah. So all these northern 
cities, they all, all those people, those tribes kind of ceased to be. Those were the ones that were taken over by all the opposing kingdoms. So you had the Babylonians, you had the uh, Assyrians, you had someone else, I can't think of, Babylon, Greece, Syria, or the Assyrians, Babylon, Sumerians, Sumer took them over. Uh, so all of those kingdoms surrounding them enslaved them at some point. So you had this big di diaspora. They're all scattered all over the place. The other thing that was different about the Samaritan people is, you know, the Judeans have all of the Hebrew Bible, right? They have Moses, books of Moses. They have, you know, the Chronicles of the History, Chronicles, Kings, Samuel, so forth. They have the prophets. Okay, so you have the minor prophets, the major prophets, and the wisdom, the wisdom of Solomon, uh, Ecclesiastes, the Psalms, of course. So they had all of that. The Samaritan people only had the books of Moses. That was it. They denied that anything else was scripture. They only believed in the books of Moses. And that's it. Everything else is not scripture. Just Matthew, or Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That was it. Uh, which was a thing. Uh, which, oddly enough, if that's all you had, you still find Christ in it. You still find the Messiah in it. You still see what you need to see. Okay, so that's the deal with the Samaritans. And they hate each other, of course, right? So that's why you have the story of the Good Samaritan, because a Jew would look at a Samaritan like he was a dog. They're not even human. Because like these, because that they reject the rest of the scriptures. They're terrible people. Uh, they have nothing to do with each other. The Samaritans don't have any lost love for the Jews either, for the Judeans. So there's that conflict between these upper and lower kingdoms. Okay, so that's the scene. That's the scene we saw in the New Testament with, with Christ and with, that is continuing now. Okay. Meanwhile, we have this fellow in this same city of Samaria, whatever city it is, uh, who is practicing magic. And he thought he was pretty special because he was doing this magic. So what was magic like in the ancient world? And the, the interesting thing is the Hebrew, I think there's probably no study Bible about it, but the Hebrew word for uh, magic is writing. So writing, uh, which actually goes back to the ancient people of Sumer who... Uh, believe the things that they put in clay tablets once they evolved to a language instead of just using it for accounting and so forth. Uh, they believe that that had power. So words have power, which they do, actually. Uh, so uh, the word for magic in Semitic languages will mean writing also because the written word is like a spell. Okay? Uh, so if you write down for example, this is why Neil Stevenson went on that tangent in Snow Crash. That's kind of where he got this from. All right, so uh, this is kind of fun science fiction novel where he used uh, the idea of this idea of words being magic spells. So if you write down like the recipe how to make bread, that is power because somebody can learn how to make bread that didn't. So that knowledge had power translates to magic. This writing is magical because it has this power to teach you how to do stuff. Uh, and that concept pervaded the ancient world. And then it got perverted also. So the word magic just referred to kind of like knowledge, writing. Now, magic turns into incantations when you believe if I write these certain words, then those words have the power to make someone fall in love with me or to curse them or to kill them or to make their hair fall out, or whatever you want to do to them. And that pervaded the ideas of mysticism and magic in the ancient world, and comes right down to us to this day. And even disconnected, uh, disconnected people have the same idea. It pervades all cultures, uh, at least in the... that. Not, I'm not talking about Native America. I don't know enough about it to talk about it. Also like the Aztecs and the Incas and stuff like that. Uh, but as far as your ancient people in Europe, North Africa, and, and that kind of area, you can look at 
first off, the Sumerians, their language doesn't connect to any other language that's ever been. So when, when Sumerian died, meh, the Assyrians adopted their style of writing of cuneiform in the clay tablets, but Assyrian is a Semitic language like Hebrew, like Arabic, like Amharic, like a lot of languages. Uh, and that idea of writing having power also pervades that culture. Sumerian, they don't even know where they came from. Like, where did this people drop out of? Because their language, completely disconnected from everything else. There's not many languages in the world like that. Sumerian is like that, and uh, Basque is like that. The Basque people that live in the Pyrenees between France and uh, Spain, they, like genetically, they don't connect to any other race on Earth. And language-wise, their, their language has nothing to do with any other language family. It's bizarre. They're like an island all to themselves. So Basque, Sumerian are like the few, two of the few languages that are like that, where they're not connected to any other language family. Others like English, I mean, our, the English goes back very, very far, but it is borrowed and adopted from so many other languages, can come, become a complete hodgepodge. So we borrow from, from ancient, like Proto-German, Gothic, uh, French, early French, uh, Saxon, uh, the Angle people, the Nordic people. English is just a mishmash of all these things. And then magic in the Nordic countries, and they had runes. You know, they didn't have a real writing system until much later. Uh, but when they were doing runic inscriptions, those were magic. You know, the, those runes, someone who had the ability to write runes, because they weren't illiterate people. They did everything by memory and oral tradition. You know, so they would engrave runes on objects, antlers, stone, what have you. And those inscriptions had power. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. That you would, you would inscribe these runes and they might have the power to heal somebody. Or would have the power to ask for good fortune. Or to become famous was big. You know. uh, and to this day, guys are getting, you know, maybe instead of tribal tattoos, they're getting Nordic tattoos. They're getting rune tattoos. A uh, big one is the compass, the rune compass. Uh, so you always don't get lost. Or uh, ruins that say you're a great warrior, or ruins ruins that uh, will help you in battle to be strong in battle. All that kind of guys are still to this day getting those tattoos. That stuff doesn't go away. Uh, they, do they really believe that those ruins have the power to do that? No, but couldn't hurt. Magic comes down to us in our day. You know, you have astrology, right? We have the signs and the stars. My mom was even not as hardcore into it as some, but she really, really liked to read about astrology. Uh, and Cradle to Grave Lutheran, go figure. Uh, but there was the harm, but it's, you're putting your trust in something other than God, you're putting it in the stars. Uh, magic to this day, people, a lot of people still have that superstition. You see that in cultures in Eastern Europe, Western Europe too, in Italy very superstitious. The, you know, it's the seat of Roman Catholicism. Superstition pervades their culture. All kinds of superstitions. Um, many of them having to do with amulets and with with writing stuff down. You know, so if you... Uh, and that actually penetrates the Catholic Church to a degree. So you have a statue of a saint and, you know, if you're trying to sell your house, you bury St. Joseph upside down in the front yard and you'll sell the house. Or you put a Bible verse on something and you put it away because those words have power, which we get right down from Judaism because they had the, uh, uh, the uh, what are they called? Not phylacteries, it's their curls. The, uh, I forget what they're called, but the, the scripture says they have the word of God on your right hand and before your eyes. So Orthodox Jews will have Bible verses in a little leather box, which they will tie to their forehead when they're praying and other ones that are in a thing they tie on their arm. Flex. Okay. Phylactery, I, I want to say that's their curls, the phylacteries. But maybe it is the phylacteries is the boxes, I can't remember. But yeah, that's the word that came to mind, so maybe that is it. Uh, that comes down to us with, with having superstition about our Bible verses. I mean, do, does the word of God have power? Absolutely. But does putting a you know, Bible verse in your shoe do anything? No, but... Those kinds of superstitions come right down to us to this day. We, we can find it in Christianity, and we can find it in the pagan society at large in which we are surrounded. There is, uh, 
we tend to put power, give power to to objects or words or phrases, uh, where it's not what the words say so much as the idea behind them. Uh, you see that in in Masonic symbolism. We see that in uh, some of the conspiracy stuff about the Illuminati, but some of that is also based in fact that's gotten shady through the years. But but throughout history, words have been believed to have power, uh, not because it's the breathed out words of the Holy Spirit, but because you make the words into an idol. And when you, you know, when you try to give them that they have power just by the fact that they're written somewhere, you've turned it into an idol. It's not what the actual words say. Uh, that's the difference. And it's easy to fall into that, right? People do that. I mean, you probably know people that like fortune tellers and palm readers and superstitious stuff. Uh, people still do that with words today. It's like saying, Ted, our fathers and Ted Hill areas of your sin is forgiven. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can see that. Uh, like those words have that power to forgive sins, which they do, but not because you did them, because they actually contain the word of God. It turns it inside out. Okay, so that's, that is what magic was like in the ancient world, where they had believed that, I mean, they believed, first of all, much more than we do, that spirits are all around them. They maybe didn't understand, you know, the pagans didn't understand that you have good angels and bad angels, and you have the Holy Spirit, and so on. Uh, the cults of the dead, believing that the dead, the spirits of the dead are around us, and you can use them, that's voodoo in the new world. Uh, hoodoo in the new world. Uh, and in Africa. So you have all this, all this stuff all twisted together where these words somehow have power unto themselves. Very common in the ancient world. Uh, and just magic in general. That thinking that someone has the power to cast these spells. To make, use these words to affect change in the world. There's only one thing that had the creative power to speak and actually have a change anything. And that was God when he created the universe. He did it by speaking. So it's understandable that we would want to claim that creative power for ourselves because what is man's biggest thing? Turning themselves into God. That's what we do. So why wouldn't we think we have that creative power? So that's enough sidetracking about magic. But that is, so that's what the Simon guy is doing. And he's done a good job of uh, laying it on really thick because these people are obviously believing him, right? So there was this man, Simon, who previously practiced magic. And they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest. So he had everybody convinced because this man has the power of God that is called great. Okay, so God, our God, is the God that is called great. So it's like somehow he has this power, but he has the power of God because they probably heard about these guys that can cast out demons and heal the sick and raise the dead. Right? Uh, so somehow he is doing these things. And so they paid attention to him because for a long time he amazed them with his magic. All right, so he somehow convincing these people that he has this power. So it's like, oh, well, you know, people were naive back then. Of course he did, right? You, people were gullible. We have faith healers today. Do we send them a lot of money today? Do they actually heal anybody? No. So how are we any different? It's like, oh yeah, he had all these people snowball because you know he could do the stuff the apostles did. He had them convinced. Ah, well, how was he doing that? Well, maybe there's two possibilities. He was actually able to do some of this stuff, which means who is working through him? Demons. All right. Thing two was, well, he was just a charlatan, just like all the faith healers we have today. You know, so I guess, you know, send me this much money or God will call me home. Who did that? Was that Pat? Who was that? Was that Oral Roberts, one of his? That if you don't send me the money, that I'll take me? Or is that Pat Robertson? Was that Oral Robertson? Yeah. I saw a 600 foot Jesus and he told me, if you don't send me money, he's going to take me to heaven and you won't have me to listen to anymore. Like, why wouldn't you want people to not send you the money because then you get to go home? But, no, okay, whatever. 
All right, so we have these idiots today, too. We're not any different. That ancient people were not dumber than we are. And in, and in a lot of times in the ancient world, they were smarter than we are. They were a lot more on the ball. We lost more knowledge that they had for thousands of years, you know, for a thousand, nearly 2,000 years, that they knew how to do this stuff. And we're only just now rediscovering, you know, in the last couple cent century or so, rediscovering that they knew how to do a lot of stuff. They could build some pretty neat things. You know, and it still is like, how did they do that? You'd be amazed what you can do with a file and a scribe, and a straight edge. You know, like the, not to go off on another tangent, but if you can find a good documentary on the anti thecara mechanism, which was an ancient computer made of brass, and this thing was used for calculating eclipses and other celestial events, and it's not just a simple, okay, well, this is when the, how many times the moon goes around, and, you know, this is how many days it takes the moon to go around. It took into account... The fact that the moon's orbit is tilted from the Earth, which they didn't necessarily know this, but because the moon orbit is tilted to our orbit, when it goes around, otherwise there would be an eclipse of the sun every month, because every month the moon goes between us and the sun. But there isn't one because its orbit's inclined like five degrees, which is enough. This thing took that into account and would have to be able to calculate that because they knew the cycles, they just knew the timing. It had gears with weird numbers of teeth, like weird numbers, like 127.5, like cycles of 127.5. So they had like 128 tooth gears, 126 tooth gears, all made by hand. And this thing could calculate with incredible accuracy all these celestial events. Why? For navigation and for timing, for timing the harvest, when to plant. Simple stuff like that is what we think it was for. And this thing was lost in a shipwreck off uh, the name Antithecara. So here is an island in off of Greece. It's called Thecara. And then you have another island on the other side called Antithecara because it's on the other side of Thecara. That's all that means. And that's where the shipwreck was. So that's where they, what they called it. They named it after the island. So they discovered this thing. These people made it like, you know, many, many, many hundreds of years ago. I'm like, well, how did they do that without sophisticated machine tools? There's a guy in England, and you can find the documentary. There's a guy in England. He does, this is what he does. And so he gets some, like, sheets of brass, which they could make, and he cuts it out because they had scissors. They could cut, you can cut sheet metal. And then he sits there with a file and a set of dividers, which allows you to, okay, I need to make this many divisions, and starts cutting gear teeth by hand because that you can do that. You can do all this by hand with a file, a set of dividers, and a straight edge, and something to scribe with. And he reproduced this machine. And there's like, yeah, and they're trying to figure, it's like, I can't figure out what this is for, or why this is. And then they're like, oh, this is how this works. Once they start building and putting together, it's like, yeah, this is what this thing can calculate. And everybody's like, wow, <laughs> they really knew a lot of stuff. They knew a lot of stuff about signs and seasons, right? So the ancient world knew how to do stuff, right? And they also believed in the supernatural because the supernatural is real. We don't anymore. We maybe say we do, and we like shows about ghosts and stuff, but we don't really believe in the supernatural. We don't believe that there are angels protecting us, and we don't believe there are demons out there trying to do stuff to us. But there are. The ancient people accepted that. You know, so they accepted... Everything in their worldview took in God and the unseen and also took in everything they saw in the natural world and how that works. We don't. We're, we're, we're blindering ourselves to, to uh, half the world, probably, because we don't want to be accepting of that which God tells us exists. I don't know why I went off on that tangent or where I was going with it. What was I talking about? Ancient people weren't stupid, Mayor. So ancient people weren't stupid. So just saying, well, they're gullible, and that's how he, that's how Simon was fooling. There's people fooling people today with stupid schemes, right? How many, how many phishing schemes are there active at any given time that they're swindling older people, right, out of a lot of money? Right? So, oh yeah, we're we're so much smarter, right? Okay. So he's got these people convinced that his is the power of God. Like I said, how many TV preachers are doing that? All right? 
But then Philip comes along and it's like, mm, Philip's actually preaching the true gospel and their wor- ears are being receptive to the power of the Holy Spirit. So they're being, their conscience is being converted. You know, they are believing in Jesus now. And it's like, okay, well, they are believing Philip and they're getting baptized left and right. So even Simon says, hey, mm, this is the real deal. I'm going to get baptized too. So he gets baptized and he keeps going on with Philip, and he sees signs and miracles, and he's like, yeah, this is the real deal. Like, this is the real deal. Look at what he's doing. It's probably a good, uh, you know, an about-facing magician, that's probably a really good witness to like, yeah, I used to be this guy, but then this guy's for real. Well, look at this. All right, so now the apostles are at Jerusalem. Everybody else is scattering and preaching. The apostles are kind of staying put for now, right? They're still in Jerusalem. And they heard uh, that, hey, the Samaritans are receiving the gospel, which Jesus predicted would happen, right? You will go from Jerusalem to Samaria to the ends of the earth. Okay, so Samaria, they've got the gospel. Let's go see what's going on. So they went down. Uh, You know, they prayed for them because the Holy Spirit hadn't fallen on them. This is a weird little passage here because when you're baptized you get the Holy Spirit that's why we baptize people right that's why we baptize babies so on Pentecost you saw the power of the Holy Spirit you saw the Holy Spirit like a tongue of fire right so you, they saw and they heard everybody speaking whatever the apostles were saying they heard it in their own language there was something special went on that day so they're like well they haven't received the Holy Spirit in that way but Luke is going to point out these different groups receiving the Holy Spirit. Uh, these, new, these groups knew about Jesus from the Old Testament. They knew about the promise of the Messiah. And now you're going to see Luke point out, now the Holy Spirit came to this group. So now Peter and John are going to pray over these people, and Luke is going to record the Samaritans have received the Holy Spirit. Two more chapters we are going to see that the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. Then later on, we're going to see the disciples of John the Baptist receive the Holy Spirit in chapter 19, way down the line, uh, because they're still around. Uh, But the receiving the Holy Spirit in this way confirms to them in their minds, Jesus is the Messiah. Is this a special form of the Holy Spirit? This is a little difficult because, again, we know that we receive the Holy Spirit in baptism. These people are being baptized, but they said, oh, they have not. We're going to pray for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because he hasn't fallen on them yet. What's going on exactly? Is this a literary device? Is this for real? They didn't get the Holy Spirit? Was this baptism different than our baptism? I'm not getting a good answer out of the commentaries. People, skip, they gloss over this. They're just like, yeah, this is a difficult passage. And they move on. They don't even try to explain it. That it's, it's just hard. Um, so I'm going to say literary device to a degree because that's what Luke does. He uses a ton of literary devices and he's going to show how, you know, Jesus preached here. He preached in Jerusalem. He preached in Samaria. He preached to Gentiles. And then it's going to go out to the rest of the world. John the Baptist sent people to Jesus saying, are you the one or should we follow a number? All these groups that Jesus preached to, Luke is going to call out at a specific time in Acts and say, and the Holy Spirit came to this group, and the Holy Spirit came to this group, and the Holy Spirit came to this group. Did the Holy Spirit come upon them when Jesus preached to them and they believed that he was the Messiah? Yeah, he did. But Luke is making this point. Um, what to make of that point? Again, I'm not getting a good answer out of the commentators. They just kind of went, well, you know, it's just that the Holy Spirit came upon them and they're gone. Uh, so I'm not getting a good answer. So if you're more confused now than five minutes ago, good. This is a confusing statement that gets made. Uh, and I think when people try to oversimplify it and then just move on, 
they're not helping. Just acknowledge this is a difficult passage. Uh, early church fathers write that this is by Peter and John coming down that was the imparting of the Holy Spirit unto these people. So they were baptized, but had not received the Holy Spirit like it was a two-step process. Maybe, maybe if that's what the early church fathers believed, that's probably a pretty good answer then, that that is what the early church believed was happening, that they were baptized, they were inter- they heard the gospel, they believed they were baptized, but the Holy Spirit didn't really come on them until these apostles prayed over them. That's weird because that's not how we do it today. When did that end? I'd like to know. But the early church fathers indicate, yeah, the Holy Spirit didn't really come until the apostles did this. Okay. So again, it's confusing. I think it's supposed to be. This is a hard passage. Of what exactly is going on with the Holy Spirit? But then they make the point that Simon now says, oh, well, I could pay these guys to give me the power to give the Holy Spirit because then I could charge people money for it. Okay, so that's the point. It's like, if I have this power, I can continue making money because I was doing pretty good before. I mean, I believe, you know, I believe this, but if I could do give people the Holy Spirit, I would have real power and then I could keep making money. He's got his priorities in exactly the wrong place. Uh, so this is yet another lesson in Acts teaching us about the misuse of money or the misuse of the desire for money. Right? And that somehow, because he had money, to buy it, right? What? He was the first TV evangelist. <laughs> he kind of really sounds like that. It's like, yeah, hey, if you really. teach me how to do this, I can make money. That's right. And then I can teach other people to do it. It's the first pyramid scheme. Right, it's the first Ponzi scheme. You teach me how to do this, and I can teach other guys how to do it, and they'll kick up to us, right? It's kind of how you could almost see the beginning of that. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, but Simon, in, in practicing magic, he knew what the outcome was going to be. Mm-hmm. But he was, was, that's quite different than a miracle. Mm-hmm. You know, the same, you may have the same. You may have the same outcome, but re- but it came by a different means. Right. Say it. <laughs> you know, in wrong way. Yeah, yeah. Well, one is to do the same thing. Yeah. Well, one is I say his, his magic and Peter's were was greater. So yeah. he knew that he what he was doing actually was diminishing in his sight when he saw. The greatest was actually a miracle. Yeah, whether it could actually do th- anything or not, but he was making money at it. Oh, yeah. Oh, and now yeah. these guys come along and they're like, oh, they can really, but notice, let me pay you so that you can give me this power to give the Holy Spirit. Not, let me pay you so you can give me this ability to heal people and help people, right? He didn't ask for that. He asked for the ability to give the Holy Ghost to other people. I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird. Uh, give me this power so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not with, right before God. Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you for I see you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. And that's the, that's the same thing John the Baptist said to the Pharisees. That, that's the same, hey, you guys are, you pit of, you know, you den of vipers. Pit of, you know, you den of vipers. And that uh, reminds you of the scripture, that, did we not perform signs and miracles in your name and the way from me yet? Mm-hmm. <coughs> I never knew you. Yeah, 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 get away from me, I don't know you. And say, oh, did we not perform signs and wonders in your name? Yeah. What have you done for me? Because like, you do it with a bad heart. Yeah. You know, so what is what is Peter given? Law. There ain't no gospel in that. That's all law. So I see you are in the gall of bitterness. So Simon is a slave, and he doesn't know it. He's a slave to sin. The bondage of iniquity. Um, 
So would you say the things that he was doing were satanic? They were through Satan then? I, I am, maybe. I mean, maybe there was demonic influence going on there. I, it's hard to say. It's hard to say, and you know, Luke doesn't record it. Like Luke doesn't say, "Oh, and the demon went out of him." It's like he's not possessed. They probably would have told us that. Luke would have told us that. It's like, oh, he had to be exercised because he was possessed of a demon. So either he's under demonic influence or not, but that's not important. And Luke doesn't record it because it's not important. So yeah, maybe not possessed, full on possessed. But he's listening. He's being influenced by. Maybe again, Luke doesn't tell us because it doesn't matter whether he's being influenced or it's purely of his own rotten heart that he's doing this thing. The point is, the thing he does tell us, he's in bondage to sin. Peter sees you are just, it's like your heart is rotten and that's why you want this. It's not because it's a good thing to give the Holy people the Holy Spirit. It's for pure greed, right? Right. So again, echoing Judas Iscariot again, right? He keeps coming up to mind in Acts. Like his ghost is looming large over this narrative in a lot of places. Right? And so. Do exorcisms really work? Yeah. They do. And they're still done by Lutherans. So, yeah, they are. You don't hear about it. Uh, it's because it's not as dramatic as Hollywood makes it out to be. Um, it's as simple as, well, baptism, first of all, is an exorcism. In fact, when I do baptism, I put the exorcistic, Luther's exorcistic uh, prayer back in um, from his original rite, which is in our books. It's not in the hymnal version of baptism, but it's in the altar book and the agenda pastor book, uh, where it says, you know, uh, we talk about original sin, and, you know, by, by nature we are born sinful and unclean, therefore, and you look right at the baby. So depart, you unclean spirit, and make room for the Holy Spirit. Cast the demon, cast Satan out of the baby, because he was born with it. That's an exorcism. Now, there was a lot of all, uh, fluff language in the right way back in the day. And I think you can actually still put it in. But it's like, uh, you know, from the tongue, from the ears. from the, It's called the exophagation, uh, where you blow on the baby, which people don't like it when you blow on the baby. <laughs> not today. <laughs> not today. You know, so I'm not going to like, you know, <laughs> I'm blowing the double away, right? That's what it symbolizes. But yeah, don't blow on the baby now take too kindly to that. You know, but you're supposed to stick your fingers in his ears. You're not doing that, right? That's like from the ears, from the nose, from under the tongue, from all this thing. There's all this that went with it. You know, depart your unclean spirit. Uh, so so the, you can put all that in, but you know, it's, it's kind of a little much nowadays. But that exorcism prayer, it's okay, yeah, it's time for you to go because guess what? The Holy Spirit's here and you're going to be gone anyway. Uh, but just to actually say that, so that's called the little exorcism in the rite. That uses that word. Uh, we have the rite of house blessing, where you go from room to room, and you the guys that can sing sing hymns, but you say something, you pray psalms, you go through every room and you bless every room in the house from top to bottom. People do it when they move in. People do it when they feel something strange is going on, and that has happened. I've actually done one of those. For somebody, uh, so this isn't that weird. I just people don't talk about it because um, you don't want to make a big difference. Oh, the pastors and exorcists, yeah, they are. We all are. All of us are. They just don't call it that necessarily because um, people don't like talking about demons. Like they think I have a demon, right? Uh, and it's a sketchy subject too because you have mental illness and you have demonic influence. And can you tell the two apart? No, not by a long shot. Sometimes it's black and white. I've never run into one of these cases where it's like, you know what? Even the Romans, you cannot have, they will not do an exorcism unless a psychiatrist is present. They, I mean, they have to ascertain the mental state of the person because an exorcism on someone who is influ easily influenced can do more harm than good. You can actually hurt them physically doing that uh, because their right is the whole full blown as seen on TV. You can get a copy of it on the internet and read it. 
which is just purely prayers and hymns. It's not that dramatic, but it's prayers and hymns and invocation of the saints and all the stuff we don't do. But uh, on somebody who's susceptible and, and, and easily influenced by what they hear, if they have a delusion going on and you're just reinforcing delusion, that's not good. So are people under demonic attack today? Yes. Are people mentally ill today? Yes. Is all cases of exorcism in the Bible an example of mental illness that they didn't know what it was? No, it's not. When demons speak to Jesus, I'm pretty sure those were demons speaking to Jesus and not some nonsense. Um, but in the modern world, yeah, you you don't just go traipsing off and do this. Um, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. But when people think there's something going on in the house, something's not right, house blessing. Exercise the house. That's what it is. You know, you were praying that the devil would go away. There's a real, like, we're going to sing it, oddly enough, the sermon hymn for Sunday is O Little Flock, Turn Out the Foe, which is hymn number 666 in the hymnal, on purpose. It's like, I need a hymn that casts out the devil. 666, because you don't feel like that's his number, right? So that's what number that's deliberately put there as that number on purpose. There are 24 exorcistic hymns in the Lutheran hymnal, in our hymnal. Um, they're not going to look like it. They're not going to go, yeah, that being well, little flock turn out the folk. Pretty much, pretty much, you can read the, lyric, the the verses and go, yeah, this is about casting out the devil, keeping them away. There's tons of them, tons of them. Uh, and there are 24 specifically exorcistic for keeping the demons at bay in there. So, yeah, demons, yep. Do exorcisms work? Yep. Every time you baptize a baby, for sure it works. Yeah, you can do house blessings. The the praying over by somebody you think is to possess that's television, that's movies. Um, Rome still does it. In fact, they just uh, in the last few years called to uh, get more exorcists because people aren't trained to do it. But yeah, we we talk about it openly in seminary. Everybody's like, okay, this is going to be good, and you're like, okay, that wasn't as big a deal as I thought because it's not. It's it's prayer. You're not the one doing it. You don't have the power to do this. It's like, I don't have magic power to cast out demons. Jesus does. So you use God's word. And God's word does that. God's word does what it says it does. And so we have God's word that keeps the devil at bay. So to answer your question the short way, yeah, they work. It's just praying. And whether you believe in what you're praying or not doesn't actually matter because the word of God is effective and living and active, whether you believe it or not. So saying those words, saying the word of God, using the word of God and praying, it does what it says. It says what it does. Did I answer your question? Because yes. I went tangential a little bit ago. Okay. Yeah, demons are a weird topic because, ugh, and we love to talk about it because it's weird. Right? It's creepy. But, yeah, they're there. Like how many how many fallen angels are there? A lot. Don't know how many, but there's a lot. Satan swept his tail. You know, the word dragon swept his tail and swept a third of the scars from the sky, Revelation says. So a third in apocalyptic literature doesn't literally mean one third. It means some but not a majority. So but still it's a bunch. So if there's myriads upon myriads of angels and you take a goodly proportion of them, that's a lot of demons. I always think of it, and I have no basis in scripture for this, this is my speculation, if we each have a guardian angel, it would not surprise me that there is a demon out there for each of us to, to poke us. Maybe. I don't know. But I mean, is there a reason why every culture kind of has that idea of the good, good angel and bad angel on your shoulder? Is there a reason every culture has something like that? It's probably a good reason for that, right? Just like every culture has a story of a cataclysmic flood, but the flood didn't happen. Okay. But we have a cultural memory of it throughout humanity, but okay, it didn't happen. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. I love those. (laughs) There's a place in Madison, and this place has got, I think, three floors in it. Okay. You probably know what I'm talking about. And it's supposed to be, especially the third floor. Supposed to be we have a haunted house? It's a seminary off of 528. Really? Or, I need to go there. It's on the middle of the Yeah, middle of the Oh, really? Right next yeah. to the water tower. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
They do haunted tours. It's been on multiple TV shows. I totally got to go there now. One night out of the year, the people are allowed to go spend the night. But you have to make a reservation to be able to do that. And they say, I know exactly what you're <laughs> they say that there are children that toss a ball and that you can hear it rolling down the hallway. And there's you a know, lot of different things. And I always thought that once you died, the body goes into the ground, but the soul either goes to heaven uh -huh, or hell. Uh -huh. and, and they have no idea what's going on here. Yeah, right. and it's, it's like these, these spirits are... Yeah, so who's here. making the noises? All right, so let's talk about talking to the dead, because a lot of cultures have that, speaking of magic in the ancient world. So many cultures... I mean, J Japan has made an entire religion on ancestor worship. You know, they worship their gods are their ancestors. That's, Shintoism is full of ancestor worship. Uh, and other Eastern religions very much... Uh, the animistic religions of, of the Americas has also got ancestor worship in it, not the Native American. And you even saw that in pagan England uh, before Christianity came, that they worshipped ancestors. And, you know, the Norse people also. Uh, you know, in, in uh, Votanism, uh, the Germanic people, uh, you know, the worship of Odin, and where you go when you die gloriously, you go to Valhalla and all the warriors there, and you can pray to all those people. You, know, you don't just pray to the All Father, you pray to all the spirits, right? You, know, you pray to the spirits of all the dead warriors for help and bell. All cultures, many, many cultures have that where, where you're talking to the dead because you think that they can do things for you. Um, you know, hoodoo. In the Africa, the African uh, religions that, that they then came to the West Indies and turned into, uh, you know, what we think of as voodoo in like Louisiana and uh, that island I can't think of off the top of my head, Haiti. Um, so those those religions uh, also have degrees of being able to talk to talk to the dead. So if the dead are dead and they are in the afterlife, they're in heaven or hell, then if you are getting an answer from somebody, who's answering? Who's rolling the ball? That would be the fallen, masquerading as the dead. So when you have these necromancers, or those people who try to raise the dead, the, the people who, uh, mesmers, right? They have the seances try to talk to the dead and if you actually and they're not faking and you actually get some kind of response and something's responding well then who's responding what's making that noise it's a demon <laughs> masquerade against the dead so you really don't want to do this Ouija boards everybody thinks that's harmless that's not harmless the, the thing I was involved in about a year ago now all came about because of one of them things. So those those things are uh, that was featured heavily in the original movie, The Exorcist. Also, it all came about because this little girl was playing with a Ouija board. So that's Ouija, how it starts. how it starts because everybody's like, oh yeah, this is a fun game because it's not really moving. But except so many people said, well, no, the thing moved. It's like we weren't doing that. It moved and it spelled something. Okay, maybe if it did. That ain't a spirit. I mean, it's not a good spirit. You're not speaking to the spirit of your grandma, telling her that she still loves you. That's a demon masquerading as the dead. Don't do that. Don't mess with that stuff. I had one experience like that. Yeah, so many people play with that thing. Very young. Yeah, and they think it's harmless, and it's not it's gateway. Mm -hmm. why, why do you want to invite them in? Why would you want to take the chance? It's not... Any, any answer, any communication that's going to come from the other side of the veil can't be good. So don't do that. Hmm? Ah, the Witch of Endor, yeah. What book is that in? I can never remember. Got me. That's, that's it. It's not Samuel. i got to look it up. That always, that always bugs me when I can never remember that. So I always say, oh yeah, you know, the witch of Endor, and you're like, who? It's in the Bible. But then I can never tell people where it is, because I'm an idiot. 
You would think I'd remember that. I probably might be unbewitched. Her mother was named Dora. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Samuel. I was going to say Samuel. Right, right, right. That was Saul consulted her to speak to Samuel, who had died. Right, so she's a necromancer. Right, right, right. First Samuel. First Samuel. And yeah, for some reason, the Russians love painting her. It's like there's lots of paintings of her. So anyway, yeah. So yeah, Witch of Ender, a good example, is another one that was trying to communicate to the dead. Don't communicate to the dead. Now, I think she actually could. I don't, I have not read the story in a long, long time. So I'm not going to. But it worked. That's maybe different. Maybe different. God allows, if God allowed it, right? Yeah, it's also like the uh, the rich man and Lazarus, right? And the rich man goes to hell and he sees Lazarus in heaven, yet we know there's a gulf between heaven and hell that can't be crossed. And the rich man says, oh, send Lazarus to tell my brothers before it's too late. So is that a parable or did that actually happen? I will leave that for you to decide. I, it may be actually happened and God allowed it specifically to teach a lesson or it's a parable and is not meant to be taken literally. Maybe, I don't know. Even talking to other Lutheran pastors, it's like, well, you know, that's that's a that's a story, that's a parable, and it's like, no, that's true. It's like they and they very strongly opinioned about it. So it's another one of those things where we just go, ah, I don't know, it's one or the other. But the point being, don't try to talk to the dead because if you get an answer back, it's not who you think it is. The, the only thing that you're going to hear from is a demon who's going to masquerade as whoever it is you want to talk to so that you let them in so that they can hurt you so they can turn you away from God which is ultimately their goal is to break your faith Um, yeah so don't talk to the dead gotta be careful how you tell children that it's like yeah yeah you know grandma's in heaven she'll know what's going on she can't see you don't tell them that I have, I, I almost did as like, don't tell them that. They don't need to know that yet. They're little. They don't know what your mom and dad had taught them. Don't contradict them, right? Ugh. Just like I know. Continuing. Sorry about that. So, yeah, there's a time and place to correct children's beliefs, but some of this stuff is like, do they really need to know that when they're little? Man, probably not. Depends. Depends if they're sharp and they're into this stuff and you talk to the parents versus like can I tell them like all dogs don't go to heaven they don't have souls but there's a movie <laughs> I know that's what I do when I yell at my cat it's like oh yeah you keep doing that just remember when you die you're dead because you don't have a soul the cat doesn't care because cats are half demon anyway I'm convinced. Nine lives. <laughs> protections of the gates the guardians of the dead or something in the corner of the Egyptians. Oh, yeah, yeah. The cat, that's why I always loved the uh, the Egypt section at the Museum of Natural History in Chicago. The number of mummified cats they have in their collection is enormous. Oh, yeah, they mummified cats all over the place. Like, they were really into their cats. It's amazing. I mean, that's why they're witches familiars, too, is because it's thought that the cat has one foot in this world and one foot in the spirit world because they're so spooky, mysterious anyway. I think it's just because they're general aloofness. I mean, you have a cat, but you don't own a cat. You, yeah, they, just, they, just, they just tolerate your presence and make sure you take care of them. <laughs> so actually, they are kind of a god in your house because you... They don't lift a finger and you just take care of them. And they're like, yeah, I don't want to pay attention to you. And they go away, right? They do what they want. Yeah, cats are weird. And, and cats act like they can see stuff that's not there. No, that's freaky. I, well, I caught one cat doing I realized it was a tiny, tiny gnat flying around. And you couldn't see it. And all of a sudden, they caught the light right. It's like, there is something there. And it's just looking at this little tiny, tiny bug flying around. And it's like, oh, okay. I thought it was looking into the spirit world. 
It's just a bug. And then he ate it. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Once he admit that my dead Bhagavad breathed, it'll do my devotion. And if I don't pet the cat for a minute, and then when I'm done, when he's, she's, he's tired of me petting, he'll lay right here, and I can close my Bible, and he's not finished, and his hand will start like, I'm not done. I'm not done. Yeah. It is so funny. But if, if that's our ritual every night. And he'll go to sleep right here, but I can't see that. I close the book and I was reading that. You know? <laughs> Cats are weird. Cats are weird. You're closing it. <laughs> well, I was actually worried about having enough to talk about in this chapter. And we, we've been going for an hour, or we're like halfway through it. So, there you go. Well, we don't have much. We do have, we'll talk about the Ethiopian eunuch real quick. I always have liked this passage, like when I got installed here as pastor, the vice president of Beaumont asked me what text do you want? I asked him to preach. And he said, well, what text do you want me to preach? And I said, Ethiopian eunuch. He goes, awesome, great, it's about baptism, right? And I love talking about baptism. All right, so now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, I don't know, why, why are we back to calling him the angel of the Lord? Because it's Jesus. Whenever you see angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that's the pre-incarnate Christ. That's the son, right? The second person of the Trinity. So here now we have the angel of the Lord, meaning Jesus, says to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Yep, desert back then too. So you have an Ethiopian eunuch who is in charge of all the queen's money. Okay, so why a eunuch? Because they, when someone is a eunuch, uh, they can be trusted because they have no sexual desire whatsoever once that happens. Uh, and so you don't have to worry about them um, whoring around, basically, to be blunt about it. Uh, and so uh, eunuchs rose to very high positions of power in the ancient world. Uh, just because you didn't have to worry about them trying to carve their own dynasty because they can't have descendants, right? Because they're not able to have to uh, have children. So eunuch in charge of a lot of money, and he's reading, of all things, Isaiah. And this is also our great passage, also why I picked it for my installation here, was because you know the Spirit said, you know, go talk to this guy. So he goes and talks to him and says, well, hey, do you understand what, you're, what are you reading, Isaiah? You know, you heard, you heard him reading Isaiah. Well, why did you hear him? Because in the ancient world, to read meant to read out loud. That's what you did. Uh, you read out loud because that helps your memory. And also because reading out loud helps train your mouth to speak. So when you read out loud, read aloud, you are training your mouth to speak. So when you read your Bible, once in a while, read it out loud. And he goes, well, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, well, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip up. So this is about, well, how can you understand Scripture unless you have a pastor to tell you what it means? Well, do you need a pastor to tell me? Because I can sit with my Bible on my deck and I can read it. And that's how you go down bad paths sometimes because you don't know what it means. Uh, I don't know what everything means either all the time. I have to look stuff up. If I don't know something, I'll say, i got to look that up. Uh, but I have the sources. I have the training to know how to look it up, to look at and go, this source is not good. This source is good. Um, and I have training on to guide me of how to interpret because I have a guide, the Book of Concord, which tells me how to interpret the Bible. Um, not because it's equal to the Bible, but because the Book of Concord came out of the Bible, which is why it's our confessions. So, how can I understand unless somebody teaches me? And how do you have someone teach you? You have to have a pastor, which is why we need church. Uh, preaching to the choir here, but you know, you have folks that say, I can just read the Bible on my own, and in nature, I can sit on my deck and read my Bible, me and God, and that's good enough. And no, it's not. It's not what God wants you to do. You have to have community. That's why we have a place like this. Uh, and this is the only place you find word and sacrament. Is places like this, you can't do the sacraments by yourself. Uh, I can't do the sacrament by myself. I can't go, I can consecrate elements, right? I'm a pastor. I can't go like, oh, I want communion. 
I can't do that by myself. Number one, it's forbidden. <laughs> Number two, uh, you can't. You can't do it by yourself. There has to be more than one. So you can't have all the benefits of the means of grace unless you have a community. And just reading the Bible off on your own, you can turn it into whatever you want it to. And inevitably, as sinful humans, we will turn God's word to where we want it to be, right? That's what we're going to make it. We're always going to twist it. Somehow, at some point, we're going to twist it to what we want it to mean instead of what it actually means, because sometimes what it means, we don't like. Some things are hard. Some things we don't like to read. Inevitably, one person on their own with the word, given enough time, is going to turn it into his word, not God's word. So that's why. So how can I unless someone guides me? And invites Philip to come up with him, and he was reading this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth, which is in the intro it for Good Friday? Or Monday, Thursday. It's in one of the Holy Week intro. It's, it's this appointed, uh, one of the appointed readings. Uh, in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? Okay. Okay, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And we can read this with hindsight as Christians, right, in the modern age. We go, it's about Jesus. Who else can that be, right? But that wasn't so easy back then in the early church. It's like, well, what, what did some of that stuff in the prophets mean? Like, we get, it's all about Jesus. But a whole generation missed that the Messiah came and fulfilled all this stuff. All right, so who can describe his generation? For his life was taken is taken away from the earth, which it was, but it was given back. Neat. All right, and then Philip opened his mouth. This phrase, and so and so and so opened his mouth. Uh, they also, you notice, they use that for the word for Jesus. And Jesus sat with his, with the crowd, had them sit down, and he opened his mouth and said. So it's not doesn't just say he said. When you see someone opened their mouth and said, that means what's coming out is God's word. This is the Holy Spirit's getting ready to talk. So beginning with this scripture, goes, okay, we'll start here. Let me tell you about Jesus, right? And didn't take long. He told him about Jesus and said, oh, hey, we're in a desert, but there's some water here now. So what's to keep me from getting baptized? Nothing. Let's do this. So they did. All right. So they went down and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, this is the proof text everybody uses for dunking because they went down into the water and they came up out of the water. So they must have went under the water. Eh, maybe. But usually that phrase just means they went in the, and they went in the puddle or in the river or whatever it was and they came out. All right. Uh, doesn't necessarily. Doesn't say how far they went in. Yeah, it didn't say. And they went in over their head with their head, the tallest part of their head covered by at least four inches of water. And it's just like I asked my confirmation kids, well, what if it was muddy water? Did it matter? No. No, because the Jordan wasn't clean. The Jordan isn't that nice, you know. Uh, so can I baptize somebody from a puddle? Like, okay, so you're in a war and this, hap this happens, especially in World War I. So they're in the trenches. It's muddy. And it's like somebody's like, yeah, I, ooh, I never believed in God before, but I sure do now. It's like, well, you, have you ever been baptized? No. Right there in the mud. Just water. It's water. It's water with dirt in it. And they baptize them. So does that, does that work? Yeah, it does. Does it have to be a pastor? No, it doesn't. Anybody can do it. There's, it's the words and the water that do it. It's the word of God connected to water that does it. It doesn't matter who does it. Um, we do it with a pastor in a church because it's public. Everybody knows that kid was baptized. We saw it happen. So if there's ever any question, oh yeah, I remember when you were baptized. We saw you. Is it not being immersion? Doesn't have to be. I mean, we I mean, teach... The word baptize itself. The word baptizo just means to wash. Yeah, just means to wash. It doesn't mean to... The submersion business that it they, can, uh, like most many words, just like in English, words have many meanings. It can mean to submerge. It can mean to sprinkle. It can mean to what? Well, it can be used in all those cases. Uh, so the 
manner of application of water does not matter. It doesn't matter what kind of water it is. Uh, it just matters. I mean, te technically, we, when you put the water in the font for baptism, you do bless it if you remember to do it, which makes it holy water. But yeah, I actually have a little thing of holy water I carry around with me. It is water that has been blessed, that I blessed, that I put in there just in case I need it. Because some people like to know, oh, that's special water. No, it's not special water. I just have it in case I need water. There it is. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like this is water from the this is water from the Red Sea. Right the Moses parted this water, and I put it in a jar just in case. Not the Dead Sea. Yeah, <laughs> that was toxic. Yeah. So, so it doesn't it doesn't matter the kind of water. So it only matters that it only matters that he got baptized. He heard about it, and all he wanted to do was get baptized right away. Now, notice all the verses I read in the King James are not in the ESV, and you're like, "What is he?" Because that yes! sounds because that sounds an awful because that sounded like an awful like the eunuch made a decision to be baptized. Thank you. I'm like, yeah, all right, um, that's not here. There's no note. Okay, so if you notice, your Bibles probably go from verse 36 to 38. This is another one of those. I read the original King James because these new Bibles, they deleted verses. They didn't delete verses. They took them out if there is good scribal evidence that they were added at another time. Uh, many add verse 37, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that sounds like many other scribal editions that we've seen, that they have seen in the manuscript evidence. Uh, it's not in the earliest manuscripts. And you can see in later manuscripts, phrases like that get inserted. Probably by well-meaning scribes. It's like, well, we got to teach them this. Well, no, we don't got to teach them that because it's not God's word because it wasn't there. Sometimes these verses are taken out. Uh, this is King James. I have verse 37, but it also references Matthew 28, 19. Okay. Specific verse. Is there a reason for that? Now, that Matthew 28, 19, almost word for word sounds like that without even looking. But let's see. 28, 19? Yeah. 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. So it's just referencing the Great Commission in that case. But yeah. So, you can have faith and choose to be baptized, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, and usually with adults, you will ask them, well, do you, do you actually believe this? Because otherwise, we're wasting everybody's time getting you baptized. Because if you don't believe this, why do you need to be baptized? If you don't believe... I mean, getting baptized will give you faith, but you have to continue in God's word and, and so on and so forth. So with adults, you usually say, okay, we've been taught a little bit about the faith. Do you want to be baptized? Yes. Okay, let's go. That doesn't mean you made a decision. The Holy Spirit gave you the faith to say, yeah, I want to be baptized. Um, but we baptize babies because we believe baptism gives you faith. So when you are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are a child of God. You are bestowed with the Holy Spirit, which generates faith in you, which is why we baptize babies. So baby doesn't have to make a decision. It's also commanded of us. Right, and it is commanded. Because, because in Scripture it says all. Mm -hmm. And baptism now saves you, you and your children. Or you and your household, depending on the translation. So New York says that's why we baptize babies. Now, confirmation, the rite of confirmation in Catholicism, Lutheranism, probably Anglicanism, I'm not sure anymore, uh, and Orthodoxy, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, they don't call it that, but confirmation, all that is the day of confirmation. So, confirmation class is you learning the catechism. And, and getting a little bit of Bible education into you so that you can grow in faith the rest of your life based on that foundation. Actual day of your confirmation, when you take your vows, 
if you look at it, you read confirmation right and go, this looks exactly like the rite of baptism, except they're saying the stuff instead of their parents saying it for them. All it is is a restatement of the vows made for you at your baptism by your parents or whoever your sponsors were. So you're it's taking a note. Yeah. So you're basically saying, you know, do you believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth? Yes. I mean, do you believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord? Yes. I mean, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes. Okay. Those are the same questions that were asked when you were baptized. So you're just now, as a semi-adult, saying those same things that you believe what you have been taught since you were baptized. You believe this. And you understand, and we've been taught, you understand what the Lord's Supper is, and you are admitted to the Lord's table. Uh, so you've made a basic confession of faith, basically. That's what confirmation is. Um, but anyway. And then, this is cool. I just like how, how little miracles, little miraculous things and acts are thrown off at the end, like that last little verse about, and they put people in Peter's shadow, so just his shadow would touch them because they knew that would heal them, right? They had that much faith. Even if Peter's shadow touches me, I'll be good. That's in Acts chapter 3, I want to say. End of chapter 3. End of chapter 3. End of chapter 2. I know it's at the end of a chapter. Really? I think it was chapter 3. Was it 4? Maybe it was 4. Oh, come on. Don't make a liar out of me. I know it's in here. Was it 5? chapter? I thought yeah, it was. verse uh, 15. Oh, okay, right. So it's, yeah, so it's it's at the end of a section. That's right. It wasn't the end of a chapter, but they, I mean, the chapter's arbitrary. So chapter 5, verse 15, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow, <coughs> his shadow might fall on some of them. And the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So, let Peter's shadow touch me, and I know that's good enough. Just like, I know if I just reach out and touch Jesus' hem of his yeah. garment, I'll be healed. He doesn't even know I'm there. Right? He, he knew it happened. Right. All right, so, so again, you see here at the end of this, the story of Philip, Philip and the eunuch, and they came up out of the water. The spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. So he's just like, okay, you're done here. Poof, teleported. Like, okay. And then he found himself at Azotus, which, anybody know where Azotus is? What do you think that the eunuch thought? Where'd he go? It's like, okay, <laughs> I, I seen some things today, right? Now, what's cool about that is, like, how big do you think the Christian church in Ethiopia is to this day? Pretty good, right? It, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of Christians in Ethiopia. Uh, so I mentioned Semitic languages. Amharic is one of the languages they speak in Ethiopia. I, have, I, actually, have, I actually have two Amharic Bibles. I have a Protestant and I have a Catholic one, of all things. Uh, they have a really interesting language. It doesn't have... An alphabet that has a syllabary, syllabary. So they'll have a letter, and then if it has a vowel, they make a little mark on it that tells you what vowel it is. And it is a really, it's a really cool looking language, and it's read from 
that, that one's a weird Semitic language. It's read from left to right, unlike Arabic and Hebrew, which are right to left. So it, it's a neat language, but that's, and that is what a lot of scripture is written in. So you have a lot of Coptic Christians in Ethiopia. So that's one of the big uh, Christian groups there. They have different books. Like we talked about the Samaritans only had the books of Moses out of the Hebrew Bible, and that's it. So the Ethiopian church, they have extra books in their Bible. They have like the book of Enoch is in their Bible as canonical scripture uh, and some other things. Uh, But the church in Ethiopia still going to this day. How did it start? Did maybe this guy go home from Egypt? Don't know, but the, you know, you're starting to see the gospel spreading. You know, it's at least going to get to Egypt, and from Moses Egypt, married an Ethiopian woman. Moses did. Was she Ethiopian? No. Yeah, Moabite. Moabite. So Moab, another desert. But yeah, but still, you see the gospel moving. So like, here's Northern Africa, and then you know, Ethiopia is over here. You know, so you're starting to see it spread and it's starting to move. And like some of these places, you know, it's still Christian to this day. I mean, Christianity is everywhere, but you know, you're, you're starting to see the beginnings of like Ethiopia being a Christian place. Is the church in Ethiopia growing? Yeah. Is the church in Ethiopia being persecuted? Oh, yes, they're being killed. They're being killed every day. There's Coptic Christians especially are being persecuted. So church only really grows in times of persecution. Except in the United States. We ain't been persecuted yet. Industrial countries are, it's going down. Yeah, are we being persecuted yet? It's beginning. But it's not, it's it's being teased. We're we're being teased. I would say we're being teased and tested, but we're not being persecuted. They're not telling you, you got to lock your doors. You're not allowed to do this. COVID was a, a sign of the things to come, I think, with the churches. How are they going to handle it? Now, this is the gospel according to Ina. You know we're going to miss that, right? Being persecuted, we, get, is, we think of the horrible things that happen, you know, the torture of the kids, and, and that, that's and they not fight, not make it better at all. But the denial of the of, of, of your right or whatever you want to say to worship does not necessarily mean that your life is in danger. I, to me, is done through the ballot box. We have allowed it mm-hmm. as Christians to have our, our worst, own worst enemy sometimes because we elect officials and that, that laws get passed that deny us, well, they deny us, but it makes it very uncomfortable. And then with COVID 19, like, don't get, you know, you can't get together at all. Now you can go to a bar, you can have an abortion, you know, and you have a church. You can kill a baby, but you can't worship your God. Yeah, so, you know, to me, that's as much <laughs> that's as, telling. as, you know, as, as, as Ethiopia, you know. Mm. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's how it starts. You know, sure. That's how it's going to start is, oh, well, you guys can't gather to worship and you can't have more than 10 people in the same, or some stupidity like that, that, which people listen to at the beginning. And then they start going, we don't have to do this. We have rights. We remembered, oh yeah, we have freedom of religion. We don't have to, what happens inside these walls. Mm-hmm. And you, know, like, you even had well-meaning people in convocation. The state mandate is, hey, no, protect it. The, the church. State, the governor did not ever tell No, he didn't. And, and But boy, did they put words in his mouth. Well, you know, the governor said, the governor he never, never he said anything. never said that. Not once. The, we did that to ourselves. That's the right. churches did that to themselves. So, you know, it, so it begins like that. And then there'll be, oh, well, but you're seeing other things in society. You you can you can make fun of Christians all you want, but if you did the same thing about Jews or Islam or what have you publicly, well, that's a hate crime, borderline hate crime. Yeah. You can't do that there because they're protected, and they should be. I mean, the country was founded on freedom of religion. It doesn't say freedom to be a Christian. It says freedom of religion, but. We could pick on Christians because, yeah, well, you know, they turn the other cheek, right? Doesn't the scripture say Jesus' name will be a stumbling block? Yeah. And, and, and you know what? Unless, unless you know your scripture, it's it's really hard to believe that that is true, but it is. And I mean, and it's happening, we're seeing it happening, but it, we're not supposed to be surprised. And that's actually, you know, we're going to talk about that with Mark 13 on Sunday, right? It's going to be the signs of the end and the wars and rumors of wars. And don't be alarmed. 
these things are supposed to happen. These things are going to happen. And the message of the cross is folly. It's stumbling block to the Jews, right? It's, they're not, like, the cross is just stupid. Like, God, they had, so your God came to earth and they killed him. And so now, because of that, you're going to heaven. That's stupid. You know what I tell, tell people? <laughs> Look at it this way. If you if you believe and there is no God, what have you lost? Nothing. It's Pascal's way. if you don't believe, you, lost you betcha. Yeah, you're kind of host. Yeah, it's Pascal's wager. It's one of the one of the early Pascal was a mathematician. He was also a philosopher. And one of his famous uh, quips was, well, okay, let's gamble on your eternal soul. Okay, so if you say, I believe in God, and there is no God, well, what's that going to hurt? Nothing, because once you're dead, you're dead. But if you, be- don't, if you believe and there is a God, then you would be stupid not to believe in him on the off chance that he actually exists. So why would you not believe in God? The way the scripture says it, it says <coughs> Yeah. yeah, but you know what? Here's, here's the thing: that there's you a lot of say tools. you believe in God, but you believe in Jesus. Yeah, and that's the thing. That's the door. Well, see, because nature, and that's why so many religions in the world are animism, the worship of nature, because nature tells us there's got to be a creator. It didn't just happen. Look at this. Look at this. How complicated it is. Look at how majestic it is. And look how everything. You want to talk about the interconnectedness of all living things. Yeah, that's why the ecosystem is so finely balanced, because it was made. It didn't just happen that way. All right, so you can see in nature there's a creator. Isn't that called the theory of the watch? Mm-hmm. The watchmaker. Yeah. Yeah, that's the watchmaker. Now, we know God isn't the watchmaker, but you can see, because you can't get, just seeing God in nature is not enough, because then you stop at worshiping nature. You know, it tells you there's a God, but it doesn't tell you who God is. So it just it gets you started. But the fool says there's no God. I mean, he's not going to be looking at the right God, but only a fool says, yeah, that just happened. It would just... How is that not a religion unto itself? Well, it just magicked itself that way. So whatever. I digress. Yeah, you ask where Azotus is? Yes. It's west of Jerusalem. It's near the Mediterranean Sea. It's south of Java. Okay. And it's where supposedly both um, Jews and... Gentiles dwelt side by side, according to the Lutheran study Bible. Okay, there you go. So I thought it was interesting. He's going where, now where both Jews and Gentiles are. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's it. That was chapter eight. And we'll start on chapter. We'll start in at chapter nine. Is a long chapter uh, next week. So we'll start getting into again. It's narrative, but it's interesting history. So we'll just keep talking about that now it's interesting if you have a red letter bible that you know the angel of the lord told philip to do stuff but then the conversion of Saul, it's in red it's It's jesus talking and they don't like it ain't no angel of the lord jesus put the whammy on Saul, and how so that's where we'll go next week that would be a heck of a thing it's just like um what now (laughs) oh yikes that oof well, being convicted. <laughs> yeah, talk about having your conscience. Ex- yeah. when you, but when you think back, because we forget this, and then you read Paul's writings, it's like, boy, that's coming through loud and clear. It's like, I used to be like this. Now I'm like this. And guess what? You're like that too. So I know what I'm talking about. All right, so that's where we're going to go next week. I'm going to stop there.